so just buy it. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, and if you you can't use it, this poll question is not very important. If that's it, right or wrong. All right. Um, I want to see if the results are here. I'm going to stop it. Um, yeah. Let's see what we got. Okay. Let's see what we got. Results. Wow. Okay. So that 85 percent of you said your body is your body property. That 16 percent of you said it's not. Now, notice I asked the question. I didn't say, is it your property? Oh, this is not, is your body your choice? That sort of thing, right? That's for common law, maybe, right? The question here is different. Is your body property? So let's make it easier. Um, if you put B, we'll start there, right? If you put false, you want to raise your hand and explain why you think it's not property. That, that was a minority. Yeah, yeah, Mariah. Uh, what kind of, like, if I said true, would be, like, allowing my substance as a way to in a sense? What do you mean? Because, I don't know, I think of people's bodies being property as a slavery. Ah, so for, so so for do property means someone could own it. By the way, I have to carry this around so I'm going to look weird carrying my phone around, but it's only way to make this work. Okay, so you say no. Okay, anyone else put no there? False. Wants to raise your hand. Yes, Shanna. I said false because of a lot of in here. You can't sell off your organs to make money if you want to. You can't. Oh. You don't retain. So it's not like normal property because you can't do certain things to it. By the way, someone put E. <laughs> I, I know who you are, so you're not fooling anyone. I'm not going to call you out, but, but don't, don't do that. It just screws up the numbers. Right, okay. Anyone else, anyone else put D that they want to raise their hand? All right. Who was strongly A? Very much strongly A. I just think that it's like it's. I think of a chattel, like you could move it, um, you could sell it if you want. So there's nothing special at a body. It's no different than this cup or this, this, this smartphone. Oh, I mean, 85% of you put this. Anyone else convinced? Yeah, Mike. Uh, e yes, even though we can't sell our body per se or uh, in terms of organ, uh, selling organs and there's other prohibited uh, activities, it's everything else pretty much says that it, it's treated like uh, chattel. Um, mm -hmm. And OK. All right. All right, I'll do these two those I'll call on people. All right, Melissa, then Rachel. It also talks about that even if you can't like, sell it for, for your body parts or money, it's treated like a business. Oh. Like, you know, so Melissa, is there a fixed definition of what property is? Oh, so you see where I'm going with this, right? All right, Rachel, then I'll start out calling people. Do you? Okay. So can you put illegal narcotics in your body? Well, maybe you can, but can they throw you in jail for doing so? Can you kill yourself? Whoa. Assisted suicide is a crime. Suicide is not a crime because if you're successful, then, then you know, you, you're, you're gone, right? But a, attempted suicide is definitely a crime. Prostitution. Can you sell your body for money? <laughs> but not in Texas. Really. But if it's your body, it's your property, why can't you put a substance in it or let you, what a prostitute would do with the body and, uh, <laughs> uh, or, or, or anything else? I could do all of those things. I may go to jail for it. I may be prostitute. So then is it really your decision? Same way that you're. Well, oh, no, you gotta raise your hand. Now this calling out. Okay, go ahead. It's the same way that your real estate is your property. But it's also regulated, and the uses of it are regulated. Okay, so I want to introduce you to a concept, right? A concept that's familiar to law students, it's alluded to in the reading. And it's this idea of a bundle of sticks. Okay? What 
all of you are getting at, and you all gave very good answers, is that there's no single definition of what property is. There's not one single definition of what property is. There are different attributes of property. So I think, I think uh, one of you, uh, Shana, said this a minute ago. You can't sell your organ. You can't sell it. But what can you do? Shana? You can gift it. Right? You can't sell it, but you can gift it. Let me put it this way. If you want to have sex with the person, you could do that, but you can't do it for profit. The exact same act, right, becomes legal or illegal depending on whether there's payment involved. Drugs, right? Consuming marijuana might be illegal under state law, but if you have a medical license, perhaps, it becomes legal, right? The body is a very good example of this idea of bundle of sticks because the exact same action, depending on the context, might be permitted or might not be. So I'll give you an example that's a lot less gross, right? We forget drugs and prostitution and everything else, right? Let's talk about, for example, buying and selling a home, right? I think I asked this question of, of Sam maybe last week. I can't remember. Um, we only lived in a house. I asked if you could if you could have a roommate. Is that you? Yeah. yeah. So remember, I asked Sam last class. She lives in a house, right? Can't you bring in a roommate? No. Does she have a property interest in the house? She does. But how far does that interest go? For you to live there and you alone, you can't bring in third parties. You couldn't then sell it to someone else. So when I ask, is this property, right? I'm not asking. Is this like this uniform definition? What I'm actually asking about is different attributes, right? Different values of property, right? So let's just use the organ one as an example. You can donate an organ as a gift, but you can't sell it, right? So we call this the bundle of sticks, right? They're different attributes of property. You can donate it, but you can't sell it. What does that mean? You don't have the full bundle of sticks. What government does, Right, what laws accomplish is determining what sticks you have in that bundle. Right, they'll say, we'll let you gift it, but not gonna let you sell the organ. Or we'll let you have sex, not for profit, but if you have sex for profit, it's a crime. What about suicide? You got no sticks in that bundle. It's against the law to try to kill yourself. Even though it's your body, 85% of you say that's right, why can't you kill yourself? You want to end your life. In fact, even in, in, in countries that permit assisted suicide, it's fairly rigorous, um, depending on who you ask, but there are some rules about when you can actually engage in that act to take your own life. Right? So you have this bundle of sticks. But now, now comes the harder question, right? Um, do you remember where I laid off last time? Who was last? Oh, Josh, you're next? Okay, so Matt, you're up. Okay, so let me ask this question, Matt. Why does the law provide special protections to the body, right? Well, why can't this be, I think Megan said it's chattel, right? You hunt the fox, right? You hunt the whale, the dog, whatever it is, right? Why is the body special? Why is the body different? One thing that does is that the history of Slave ownership to um, has uh, the concept of the human body being uh, Why? Because you, know, you can't own another person if you can own yourself. Well, that's a very Do you own yourself? No, apparently not. But. Well, here, Joey, let me ask you a follow up question. If you own yourself, could you sell yourself? You have the full bundle of sticks, right? Could you sell yourself into slavery? I guess the answer is. Yes, if you have the full bundle of sticks. Ah, uh, so then, uh, Jenica, why do you think the law developed? This is not just the California Supreme Court. This is going back, you know, thousands of years, right? Why do you think the law has put such a special mark on the human body that that it's something that 
the usual laws of chattel just don't apply to. I think because if you could, if you could sell organs or if you could sell certain parts of your body, you might find that people would either be selling their organs mm. and either be sickly or other people would need money. And Even before organs, right? The, the ability to take a person's organ and have the person survive is fairly new, right? Organ transplants are 20 cents. Going even further back, why do you think the law of suicide developed? I never thought about it, right? But why did the law of suicide develop? Or why did the law of prostitution develop? What, what, what was the basis of these sorts of decisions? Uh, I would say, so for suicide, you have, I, I don't know, I guess I kind of like go back to you have the right to life. So Where does that come from, right to life? The, Oh, I love that answer, but this is before the Constitution. Constitution 1787. This concept pervaded long before Madison and Hamilton started writing on parchment. I guess, I don't know, otherwise you have people in chaos maybe killing each other. Whoa, okay, so Costa, Jenica's like people in chaos. Where have we discussed this chaos before? Where'd this, where, 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 we, we've discussed this concept before. If we didn't have these rules, there'd be, there'd be you know, disaster, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's, more of the of the having not necessarily owning it, but more of control, more of a possessory interest. Right, but where where are these rules developed from? How, why, why the body take on such a you know special place in our property system that chattels didn't? I, I, reading this, I would think slavery, but before um, we're, we're well before American chattel slavery. I mean, we're we're well before that. Something weird. Where did this notion come from? Um, I think, um, based on the book, that it's a, the foundation of property law. Is a property? I, I, I don't know how to explain it. The notion. You guys are fighting the answer. Yeah. You're fighting it. It's just. Where did this idea that the body is so sacred come from? Natural law. Okay. okay, now you're on the right track. What have we talked about so far? You're on the right track. Um, in regards to the body? In, in general. Just in general, um, I mean... Kay Caitlin. Um, we can't be, like, regenerated, and there's only, like, one of us. Well, that's true. That's true. But where did this idea come from? You, you guys are all fighting it. I don't know why. Nikki, you want to take a step? Okay, Brooke, can I... Have to do like religion. And religion! Oh. oh my god. No, literally, oh my god, right? Yeah, religion, thank you. Thank you for bailing your, your row out. Um, yeah, I, I don't do this in a preachy fashion, right? But if you read the concurring opinion, just as Arabian, right? It's got a really religious vibe to it, doesn't it? I mean, is this a preach or a judge, right? But, but his point, though, I think is well taken. That this idea of having... Um, uh, a special sanctity for the body predates the Constitution, right? It predates the Bill of Rights, predates Magna Carta, right? And it, it is based on some sort of notion of morality. And probably any religion has roughly the same tenets on this front. Prostitution is bad, you know, selling the flesh is bad, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most states have similar tenets on that front. But then the question is why is that part of our doctrine? And is that doctrine fixed, right? That is, today, organ sales not allowed. But what if tomorrow the government decides to allow them to be sold? So the basis of the, the first case, the only case of today, um, is that question, right? Who gets to decide? Who gets to decide how these bundles of sticks are assembled? Is it the courts that get to decide this? Is it the legislature that gets to decide this? Is it common law that just develops over time? And what I think you'll see is that the difference between the majority and the dissent in this case is on that exact question of who gets to make that decision. And depending on how you answer that question, I think ultimately resolves this case. Because I think both the majority and dissent have good arguments. They both make, I think, you know, to be a lawyer, you see arguments on both sides. They both make good arguments, right? These are smart lawyers, they're smart judges. 
and they make compelling arguments. So um, let me give you some background on the case, and then, then I'll, I'll start calling on people. Okay? All right. Um, this, is a, this is actually a fairly sad case. If, regardless of what happened, Moore got screwed, right? He, he, he got the short end of the bundle, six, as it were, right? He, got, he, he, he did not get a good, good shake. So Mr. Moore worked on Alaskan pipeline, right, which is not very glamorous work. Anyone ever do pipeline work in here? It's not plant glamorous work, is it? I believe so. Where were you stationed? I was here in Texas for Barnett. Yeah, this guy was in Alaska. It's probably even even worse, oppressively cold. Um, he found that one day his gums started bleeding, and then his belly started swelling up, right? And then bruises all over his body. The guy was 31, you know, roughly the same age as some of you, and he thought he was dying, right? He thought he was done. And he went to this hospital in California, and he signed a consent form. Probably didn't think... Does anyone ever read those forms you signed? Of course not. I don't, I don't read them. It's a waste of time. And he signed this form that says, I consent to my, uh, uh, I consent to the hospital disposing of any severed tissues or members by cremation. You can see, because that's okay. Didn't, didn't read, I'm sure. And they removed his spleen, which is an organ. So the average spleen, uh, spleen weighs about a pound. His spleen weighed 22 pounds. So I mean, he was in really, really rough shape. Okay. He then moved to Seattle, became an oyster salesman. And for the next seven years or so, he would often fly to Seattle for follow-up exams. I'm sorry, he would also fly from Seattle to California for follow-up exams. And, you know, the doctor would make him take bone marrow, blood, semen, and do different kinds of draws. And, um, you know, more wondered, you know, why are they making me fly across the state lines to get treatment? He didn't know what was going on. But at that point, the doctor started paying for tickets for the guy. And they put him up at the Beverly Wilshire, which is a very posh hotel in, in LA. So he's like, all right, whatever, I don't care, right? I'm getting a free trip to California, I don't really care. What Moore didn't know is that the doctor had filed for a line of patents based on his cells. Um, and let me just explain what this means. Um, usually with most people, right, if you take a bit of your skin, right, look at a microscope, there are cells. Your body's made up of these little organs named cells. If I were to cut some skin off your hand and put it in a dish, after some period of time it would die and it would not regenerate. Okay, your cells generally can't live outside your body. Some people, though, are special. Mr. Moore was special. Their cells have the ability to reproduce outside the body. That is, once you take the cells out of the person's body, they keep regenerating. And you can then use these cells for testing and, and vet research, whatever else. There's a very famous case I want to mention uh, that some of you may have seen the movie recently, Oprah's in it, uh, called The Secret, The Immortal Life of Henry Lacks. Anyone see this movie? Anyone read the book? The book was better, right? You read the book? The book was fantastic. I, I strongly encourage you the movie wasn't so hot, but the book was good. Did you, did you like the movie? Not really. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm glad I'm not alone. Yeah, the movie wasn't so, whatever. But the book was fantastic. It won like all these awards when it came out about seven or eight years ago. Do you want to tell us the premise of the book, Megan? So it talks about, a little about the life of Harriet Alex. And it went mostly into detail about her children. I think the youngest was Deborah. And um, how she found out about her cells. Well, well, tell us about her cells. What was so special about Henrietta? They were pure Whoa, I didn't know that word. Good. What does that mean? <laughs> so they are capable of hydrogenic kind of cell differentiation. So are you a biology major or something? So I did teach English. Okay, yeah. English, please. <laughs> <laughs> so your description was very good. Good. How the cells can Thank uh, you. I tried. <laughs> so you were talking about the cells that are in vitro, but extra. People outside the body. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. So so basically, and we're showing you, I had something to your hand with a minute ago. Oh, that was, that was, that was good? Okay, good. So here's what happened, right? Henrietta was this basically poor woman living in Baltimore. Um, she was diagnosed with cancer. And she was taken for treatment at Johns Hopkins, which is a fairly large institution in Baltimore. And they tried treating her. It didn't help. She died fairly young. I think she was in her 30s when she passed away. But one of the people who worked at the hospital took a 
culture, a sample of her cells, and they put in a dish, a little petri dish outside. And they found something magical that happens, right? The cells continue to grow and grow and grow, right? Usually, if you want cells to do research on, you have to take them from a live person, right? But Henrietta, and I think Mr. Moore as well, had a special gift that their cells reproduce. We don't know why, right? I, we have no idea. Do, do we know why, Megan? No. No, we have no idea why this person is so special. She had magical cells. That's why it's called the immortal life, because even though she's been dead for, what, 60 years, her cells are still living. So the doctors at Johns Hopkins realized, like, like, oh my god, this is awesome. And they put in for a patent on her line of cells. And they made a lot of money, like billions, like a lot of money from this line of cells. Um, they never told Henrietta's family. In fact, they shortened the name of the cells to HeLa, H-E-L-A, which is short for Henrietta. And if you notice on the cover, it's like H-E is bold. That's why. They just called her HeLa. They reduced her to a nickname. Um, the story doesn't have a particularly happy ending. Um, there was a reporter, Rebecca Sklute, who wrote this book, and she spent years trying to track down the Henrietta Lacks family and talk to them, and they didn't want to talk to her. They didn't know who this person was. And then they found out that the hospital is basically taking advantage of their, of their mother's cells. And so they tried to bring lawsuits, and under this California case, they couldn't go very far. Um, but eventually, the, um, uh, the, the, the university that has this patent agreed to put uh, members of the Henrietta Lacks family on this board to decide how the cells are used. Now, they didn't get any money, um, very carefully. They didn't want to give any money to them because they said you have no right to it, which is what we're going to discuss in the case today. But at least the Henrietta family has some say in how the cells are used. I don't know how much that's worth. Um, but the, the story is remarkable. I encourage you to read this book because it tells this, this remarkable journey of how this family, which, which wasn't well educated, how they came to understand what was going on. They didn't even know what this was. Like, you know, she explained it pretty well, but trying to explain this is not even easy even for law students, but um, it's a good story, good book. But um, Henrietta and Mr. Moore as well, they have these magical cells. And their cells create these lines which can be patented. Now, just to be very clear, the original cell they extract from Henrietta Lacks is long gone, right? The initial cell they took from Mr. Moore is gone. What they're actually making the patent on is the new stuff that's created. And I want to make this point very clear. The cells regenerate, they, they, they grow outside of her body. So Henrietta is dead, right? She's, she's been dead for a long time. But the cells she created created these cells, and those cells created those cells, and those cells created these cells, right? It's a, it's a pattern. So she never even came into contact with the cells that are currently in existence. All this happened post, after, after her life. Everyone just get that much. Stay with me, okay? So going back to the Moore case. Again, these are facts which aren't in the book, but I like to fill you in the full story. Um, after a while, the, the, Mr. Morris started getting a little suspicious, so the doctor gave him a new consent form, right? Because remember, the original consent form just talked about cremation. And this new consent form said, I voluntarily grant to University of California all rights I, or my heirs, <laughs> may have in any cell line or any other potential product which might be developed from the blood or bone marrow obtained from me. So initially he checked off, yeah, I consent, I do, right? And he told the magazine, I didn't want to rock the boat. You know, you think the guy, the doctor will cut you off. I didn't want to die. I mean, this guy almost died. So, you know, you can understand he checks whatever. But eventually Moore suspected that the doctor's not being straight with him. So during the next visit, the nurse gave him another form and he circled, I do not consent. <laughs> so then the doctor calls us, wait, you, you put the wrong option, you circled the wrong button, right? You, you circled the wrong letter. And he asked him to come back. And the Morris said, uh, here's a quote, gee, doctor, I don't know how I made that mistake. And he went back home to Seattle. Um, they mailed him the form. He refused to sign it. And said, what did Mr. Moore do? Who did he show the form to? A lawyer, yes, very good. Whenever you're not sure, you call a lawyer. That's what people do in this world. Um, so he sent the form to a lawyer. So at that point, they were not extracting any new cells, right? That was it, the cells. But he still had seven years of cells that he used to develop this line. And he called it Mo, right? Gila, this was just called Mo. They have a little nickname. And they made a boatload of, like, billions of dollars off these cells. So now I start calling on people. I think, Reed, you're next. So, Reed, um, what, 
What did Mr. Moore allege in court? What were his causes of action here? Okay, so he basically threw the kitchen sink at him, right? Everyone know that expression, a kitchen sink complaint, you'll hear this, it means you throw everything in the world at them and hope something sticks. Um, I mean, look, you guys learn about Rule 11, fine. But generally, if you don't raise something in a complaint in the first instance, it's waived. You can't bring it up later. So you have this thing called a kitchen sink complaint where you throw everything and you hope it sticks. Um, uh, is, that, is that Jake? Oh, no, I, I, I'm missing a name tag. Oh, there you are, Ryan. Yeah, I can see that one. Ryan. Um, these are all basically torts, right? Common law torts. You guys studied these last semester. Do you think when California established these torts by either judicial process or statutory, whatever it is, they had in mind organ sales? How come? Why do you think the answer is no? Because at the time that they were probably establishing these torts, with our medical terms, we wasn't able to look at details and at least citations like that. Very good. Um, Jake, now I'll go to you. What does this remind you of, right, where, where you're taking these you know, common law torts and you're applying to things that it doesn't really fit? We, we, we did something similar to that this semester. What does this remind you of? Yeah, a case or, or doctrine, where the courts are taking these common law torts and extending them to new circumstances that didn't really fit. No, no, that was a common law case. Ashton, you know what I'm thinking of? The question was, what does this remind you of? The court's taking this common law doctrine and extending it to these new circumstances with technology that just didn't exist back at common law. What does that remind you of? We've well, been in class about two weeks, two and a half weeks. We haven't had that many classes to choose from. What are, well, what? Um, like the, um, Good. So, what does what doctrine do we bring this up in? Rob, this back row is not having it. Who knows what I'm talking about? Read with respect to. Yes, exactly. Right, oil and gas. Okay, let's try this again. So, Jake, how? How did the court in the early days understand oil and gas and minerals? What, what did they compare it to? No, from the ground, I'm asking. What did they compare it to in the case law? Not hard. Ashton? What did the early common law judges compare oil to? Esther? Rob? Wild animals. Thank you. Wild animals, right? It said that the same way that a, a fox can run from one property to the next, oil is the same way. It can spread from one property to the next. Right? Now, try this one, Ashton. What were the problems with comparing oil to wild animals? Why was that a difficult analogy? In your own words, what does that mean? Um, 
But as a general matter, why is comparing Fox to oil problematic as a general matter? No, they're not the same. Why are they not the same? Yeah, right? They're not close matches, right? A fox is an autonomous entity, right? It knows it's running left or right to escape someone. Oil is not. It's a liquid. It goes wherever there's a cavity. It doesn't have any intelligence to it, right? A fox is a discrete animal. Oil is like millions of molecules of a, of a, of a, of a certain a crude that, that runs around to the ground, all right? So judges, though, often they'll reach, and they try to use common law doctrines to apply to new circumstances that it might not be the best fit, right? All right, so Patel, let me, let's move on, okay? I'm moving on with you, okay? What's the difficulty of applying the tort of conversion to this case with Mr. Moore? What, what, why is that not, I mean, Literally, you're converting, right? You're taking the property of another. I mean, as a literal matter, that, that's what you're doing. But why is this maybe not a good fit? But why is it a weird fit for the body? That's, that's my question. Oh. Okay. Good, good. So let, let me ask you a follow-up question, please. Um, when a cell is removed from the body, who owns it? Oh. Yeah, they, you, I, think, I think you're right, Melissa. They didn't want to answer that question. So everyone agrees, right? While the cell is still in your body, it's yours, right? Everyone, everyone agrees with me, right? This is like, remember the baseball and the Barry Bonds case? Once the ball is in the hand of the pitcher, it's still property for Major League Baseball. But the second, you know, Barry Bonds hit it and it went flying to the sky, it was no longer his. But, Roxy, is that the same analogy here? The second it's removed from Miss Henry Adelex's body, or Mr. Moore's body, does she forfeit any interest in that cell? We, we know with baseball, you hit the ball, it's gone, it's abandoned, right? But when you have a cell taken away from you, is that abandoned property? Did you give it away? That, that, that's the question, right? Can you use conversion there? Very good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Does any parcel belong to you? I like the way you phrase that. Right, so Natalia, let me ask this follow-up question, right? How is a judge supposed to decide this case, right? What? There's no statute governing this, right? We all agree there's no statute on point, and there's really no common law. So what do judges do, as always? Where do judges look to resolve cases where there's not really clear law one way or the other? I'm sorry? Oh, I like that customs, yeah. So what kind of customs are they looking to? They're like the like organ hunting societies? You know, what, what, what kind of traditions are you looking to? I gotta be a little bit louder. I can't hear. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. And that's what the court's trying to do. Compare this other situations. Um, so let's actually let's actually dive into the case, right? So um, yeah, Edwin, you want to talk? What what the trial court do here? What the trial court do? What the heck does that mean? Did you did you look that up? No, I don't know. No. So, so it's one L's. I love one L's. If there's a word you don't know, Black's Dictionary is your friend, right? Black's dish, Dictionary is your friend, right? Um, a, a demur is basically like a motion for summary judgment, basically, right? What that means is they ruled summary judgment in favor of the defendants, right? It's, it's, just, a, it's just a word, demur. What the hell's demur, right? But you're right. They, they ruled in favor of the um, defendants, okay? And then, Edwin, what happened on appeal then? Okay, so the Court of Appeals reversed, right? And they said that there was a cause of action for conversion, okay? Now, it's a little bit confusing, but the Court of Appeals said 
There's no authority that says that plaintiff cannot have an interest in the cells. Whoa. There's no authority that says a plaintiff can't have an interest. Andres, what's that? What, what, what are they basically saying there? What are they saying there with that sentence? There's no authority that says a plaintiff cannot have this interest. Well, basically, it's the first time they've ever viewed this, so they have no idea what's going on. Yeah. You could say it's unprecedented. I use this. I told Obamacare this morning. It works doubly, right? But it's unprecedented, right? There's no precedent one way or the other on this question. Okay? So the, 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 the appellate opinion said that, you know, absent consent, it pleads all the elements of a cause of action. Right? Now, I think Batol made a, a, fair, a good point a minute ago. Is it still your property once it's removed from the body? Right? I think that, that was, she raised, raised the point fairly a minute ago. Do you have it right? Do you retain a stick in the bundle after you give something away? Because usually when you gift something, right, if I give you a gift, it's no backseat, right? I don't get it back. Uh, that's my hand. Yeah, Kendra. Um, why didn't he bring up something along the lines of, like, copyright infringement, even though this isn't something that he, like, created or something like that? Like, why didn't he bring up something along the lines of, like, copyright infringement, even though this isn't something that he, like, created or something like that? Like a labor theory? I don't, I, wait, I don't know. Well, why do we protect copyrights? We discussed well, this last week. Isn't this uh, the ones they were using, it's the same like, DNA structure? Well, it's the same DNA, but you don't own your... Okay, I'll answer your question in different ways. Um, first off, why do we protect copyrights? Is this a common law protection? Why is it protected? This was the INS case where I said it was wrong. No, no. Why was the INS case wrong? Beyond everything else. What, what about justice was it Pitney's opinion was wrong? Yeah, Julian? Well, as a, what, you can you can own how you tell the story. That's true, but why was why was the case wrong? There was something really wrong about it. It was, it was never copyrighted because nobody copyrights the news. And as a result, why was it wrong? What what did the judge do in that case that was weird? Kendra? Well, is it because they couldn't keep up with the news? No, no, Shinoda? Is it the federal common law created? Because yes. Right. Eerie. <laughs> the judge made up a common law remedy, right? Federal courts aren't supposed to be making up common law remedies when there's a statute in place. Congress passed a statute for the Copyright Act, right? That's why we protect copyrights. It's not as a matter of common law. Is there any statute in the books here, Kendra? No. No. Now, state courts are allowed to create common law, which is effectively what the Court of Appeals did, right? He created a common law remedy. But there's no analogous copyright. Now, I like you on our copyright. Why do we reward copyrights? Because someone invested the labor into making a song or a news story or whatever else. Kendra, did Mr. Moore invest labor into making his cell be magical? No. Right. He's kind of born that way? Yeah. yeah. Right, I almost killed him, too. Yeah. I did. I mean, that, that almost killed him. Yeah, yeah, Micah. I think, in fact, the doctor could have raised that he labored into engineering the cells. Right. So I think the, the, the claim to labor would actually be more on the doctor side to recognize the value of these cells than on the side of, the, um, of Mr. Moore. Right? But I, th I think your, your point, Kendra, is who's actually being rewarded here? The person who just was born and had this 25-pound spleen? Or the doctor recognized the value? Or is it shared? Because the doctor, no matter how smart he is, couldn't have done this without the guy's cell line. Yeah. Right. Well, it's a very good thought, right? But who designed the marking? Who designed the, the tip of the spear? The, the whaler. Who designed your DNA? I'm not going to answer the question, but that's basically the answer, right? <laughs> you, you were born that way, right? It wasn't, it wasn't your labor that you were born with those cells. It's not like you, uh, you, know, you went to the gym and you exercised and made yourself an Olympic athlete, right? That's something you put labor into. But your cells, your cells. In fact, you can probably make them worse by smoking and drinking and doing drugs. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Rob, and then uh, Megan, and then Celeste, and then Christiana. Ah! 
So what's the difference between selling your kid? Not that you would ever know, right, Rob? <laughs> so why can you sell? It's actually plasma that gets you the money, not blood, right? People don't know that. Donating blood doesn't give you the money. It's actually the plasma. So why do people donate blood, semen, plasma, eggs, eggs right? But not a kidney. Why, why can you get money for that? Anyone know the answer? Yeah, yeah. Well, more than you live without it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they regenerate, yeah. Your blood regenerates, your semen regenerates, your plasma regenerates. How quickly does it regenerate, Rob, Bob? <laughs> plasma, that is, plasma, that is. Right. How often do they, how often do they let you go to the plasma bank? Is it once a week? I don't know. Twice a week. Twice a week. God bless college students, right? So, how much is the IRE subscription about one plasma trip? Uh, Oh God, a pound of flesh wraps as well. Um, ooh, bad. <laughs> it's a Shakespeare reference, please stop. Okay, good. So the question is, those things regenerate, but your kidney doesn't. If I chop off your kidney, you're not growing one back. Eggs are actually a bit different, because you have a finite amount, but it's such a significantly large number that it's more or less infinite. Hey, Julian. But doesn't that some of this taste in the cells are the ones that regenerate? Right. So. You can no, but you you could donate cells. There's no problem with that. In fact, you can sell your cells, but that's not what he did. He didn't sell them, right? In other words, if you walked into a cell bank, right, and you said, "I want to sell my cells," sell my cells, right? You could do that. They give you money for your cells because they regenerate. But for most people, buying their cells is a waste of money because they don't. Once they're inside the body, they die. This guy had special cells, right? You understand the difference? The law would allow you to sell your cells, but there's not much value in that because they die immediately. But for him, there was value. So, and that, right, there was value for this guy. I think Megan and Celeste and, yeah. To go back to Kendra's question about the DNA, I think you were saying that um, it was the exact same copy, but it's yeah. not just the DNA. So in order for those cells to regenerate, they have to create an environment conducive for those cells to regenerate. Mm. So think about like different types of liquid substances that you have to mix with the cells? Oh, well, okay, just as one rule in this class, just talk to me, not that way. But if you're ever in court, the only way you get thrown out is by talking to your opposing counsel. Always talk to the judge, because if you talk back and forth, you start getting in a shouting mask. So just talk to me and I'll relay. Okay. Thank you. So it's not, the cell line is not just the cell by itself. It's the cell plus whatever good. creates that environment conducive for the regeneration. Good, good, okay, very good. Yeah, so there's a labor theory in that as well, creating the environment. Yeah, yeah Celeste um, and Christiana? Well, I read this. I saw that they used the labor theory to justify the doctor in the hospital because they want to promote the value of the Ah, hospital. yes. But wouldn't it be theft because they went beyond the scope of consent? So when they were using that, they were stealing from him. Okay, well, that goes to the informed consent, right? Yeah. Th that, that's actually the easiest part of the case. I'll get to it in a minute, but I will get there. Uh, Christiana? His own body, right? Without a doubt, they both have a claim to the property, right? So, in other words, let me put it this way. In an ideal world, right? In an ideal world, the University of California says, you know, Mr. Moore, I'm about to take your cells and we'll give you 10% of whatever we find, right? Because you contributed. No one would object to that. But the question is, in the absence of that agreement, can the court basically go back and say, no, this wasn't valid? The initial decision to remove the cells was fine. The guy had a 25 pound spleen. They had to take the damn thing out, right? There's no, there's no doubt they had to remove the spleen. The guy would have died otherwise. He had consent for that. But whether the consent reached to then using it to make this line. Okay, Mike, don't move on. Uh, I, I know in recent years there's been uh, decisions about the trash. Once, once your trash has been put out to the curb, who owns it? Is it it's not yours anymore. property? Nope, it's not yours anymore. In fact, their case in the Fourth Amendment, you'll say Crimpro where the cops search a person's trash, right? You don't need a warrant to search your garbage. Shred. And, it, and, it, <laughs> <laughs> and paralleling, in, in the case of war, it becomes medical waste, which is, in effect, trash. Yes, yeah, it's no yeah. longer part of his And that, that was in the case, too, because with medical waste, you have to cremate it. You have to destroy it. You can't just put it in the trash can. In fact, most people don't want their extra organs because they want to do that. You know, like if you're the mechanic, right, and you get parts replaced. Oh, give me the old parts, right? Make sure they did something. You can't do that yourself. It's it's, it's medical waste. All right, uh, Matt. Then we'll move on. Last comment. Uh, 
Above what? Above oil, rights. oil rights, yes. So there's a rule of capture, you take it from his body, it's yours. Mm. See the problem, right? <laughs> well, you get rule of capture. So let's move on. So, so the, the Court of Appeals opinion, right, ruled in favor of Mr. Moore. And it said, look, we don't have to decide these big issues, but we're going we're gonna to give a judgment for Mr. Moore. And it gets appealed to the Supreme Court of California. Again, this is a common law issue. This is not a federal issue, so we don't have any sort of eerie problems, right? State common law, I'm sorry, state courts can develop common law. That's what they're supposed to do. Uh, uh, Dimitri, I think you're up next. So let's just start first with this breach of fiduciary duty. This is actually the easiest part of the case. Celeste mentioned this a minute ago. Why is this part of the case easiest? Why is this not a big deal? Yeah. Did the doctor disclose how he's going to use the cells? Okay, so he breached this duty, right? Put that down. But now, the harder part, uh, I can't see that name. Oh, Gideon, just make sure you have a big marker. It's hard to read that in little letters. Khadija, what, um, what is the remedy then for the breach of the fiduciary duty? Uh, louder. Good. So, and what's the remedy for violating that duty? Uh, oh, would they? Do you get Do you get ten percent of the patent line for fiduciary duty? <laughs> Hey, what, what do you think? Is that, uh, is that, is that Kendall? Yeah. Nice. The name tag is half mil. Yeah. What's the remedy for breach of fiduciary duty? Yeah. Yeah. You, you basically get damages, but small damages, right? You, you, get, you get the damages for, let me put it this way. He didn't disclose that he extracted those cells, right, for the purpose. The remedy for fiduciary duty goes to the measure of damages of those cells, which is not very much. Right? An individual cell by itself, like Megan said, it's not very valuable. It's only in the context of this liquid, whatever else. Like, she's smarter than me, right? But it's only in the context of this big environment that you create that it becomes valuable. So this victory for the plaintiff on this breach of fiduciary duty is not very valuable at all, right? It's basically actual damages, which is not a lot. Where it really comes to play is the conversion cause of action, right? Because with conversion, what are your remedies, right? Well, you can ask for the cells back. He didn't want the cells back. Instead, he wanted the value of the cells, but not just the cells that came from his body. All the cells down the line that were regenerated. He wanted everything, all the above, right? That is what conversion would allow, right? So again, the breach of fiduciary duty, I think one of the dissents makes this point, you know, trivial, right? You pay damage as actual, it's not a big deal. But the conversion, right, reflects an ongoing interference with his property. Every time one of his cells is used in this lab, it's an ongoing injury, which is why there's an ongoing profit. Now, the court then has to discuss, is it property once it's extracted from the body? Zach, what does the uh, majority, Justice um, uh, Pinelli, do here on the conversion claim? Okay, there's several reasons to doubt your tenancy interest. Like, give me, give me a couple of them. So the first one they say is that there's uh, well, that there's no judicial precedent. Okay, good. Okay, very good. And the third one, uh, oh, that because of the patented cell line, that that's not his property. 
Okay, good. All right, good. So let's let's take those in turn, right? So the first one he said was um, the uh, uh, it, this is not for the judiciary. The second is that there's um, uh, uh, there's some statutes in the book, and third one's about the uh, uh, the encouragement of labor. So Lucas, let's walk through the first one for a minute. Why is this not something the court should be doing? The court of appeals did it. Uh, the dissenting opinion had no problem. Why does the majority at least have a hesitancy for reaching this issue? What do you mean by that? Um, basically, they say if you have conversion on these cells, that means doctors would be hesitant to even research um, oh. or cells or anything because they would get in trouble. So, what, what, uh, Marcel, I'll go on to you. What does this remind you of, right? What kind of rulings have we seen in this class? By the way, if you see what I'm doing, I like connecting what we've learned before because this is a continuous class, Marcella. Where have we seen this before? Concerns about, you know, encouraging the uh, research and investigation, these sorts of things. What, what does this remind you of? Well, not exactly that, but the, the thought process. What does this remind you of? Um, I don't know. This case is weird. <laughs> it should. Um, we haven't done that many cases, and we'll do more and more every week. Um, okay. Um, what, 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 why, would, why would the rule of cash be favored or disfavored? No, in general. What what's the reasons why my disfavored rule of capture? Fairness and good, mm-hmm. good. So what happens if we give the fox to the jerk, not the person who spent hours hunting it, or if we give the whale to the person who found on the beach, not the person who on the boat with the spears? Um, one, if you give it to a jerk, it may, maybe it's not fair, but it's certain. Good, good, okay. But what happens if you give it to the person who finds the whale on the beach, not the whaler? And what would the whaling crew probably do the next go around? They, they, there would be no incentives. Ah, incentives. Now you see the issue. Yeah. What's the problem in this case with rolling for Mr. Moore? That it would discourage. Like, there you go. Very good. Very good. We got. We got through it. Very good. Right. The court is really not much different than the whale case, right? Again, not much. I mean, look, organs, whales, but it's the same idea. If the rule. If they rule in favor here of the plaintiff, Mr. Moore, doctors are going to be very hesitant to engage in a sort of research. And it might actually harm lives. People can't live if this research is not done. Now, Justin, what's the easy response to this, right? Are doctors really going to be discouraged if they rule for the plaintiff here? What, what's, it's a very easy response. Well, I mean, I, I think if they just get the permission. Yeah. The right. Right. What if they just get informed consent? Not just consent to dispose of the <coughs> cremations, but to actually use them for research. Remember the second form he had them sign? I described there was a force form, they change it. If they just let him sign the second form, then there's no problem because he consented to it. Uh, Lauren? Well, I guess my thing with that, which I do agree that they should get consent, but wouldn't that possibly cause, like, maybe, like, I guess prolonged litigation on what if they like start arguing about okay how much if they feel like they should get a percentage of something how much uh, they should get and things like that. But what the like, form says, we give you zero. You get zero. You get our lovely smile. That's all you get. And then, but that may discourage some people from not ever consenting. Okay, and there you go. Right. So that's the response. I think Lauren stated it well. If you gave a very clear consent form, the person might not check yes. Remember, even Mr. Moore, he checked no. Right? He said, oh, I forgot the form, whatever. Right? Now, he didn't forget. He did it on purpose. So the risk is by even giving people the option, they may opt out. And that, that may disadvantage the scientists from having that research. Now, again, you don't know in advance whose cells are magical. You have no idea. You don't know if their cells are magical until you look at them. Right? So you can't say, wow, I think you have magical cells. I'll give you some money. You have to basically check every cell to see which one actually works out. And the liquids and all the other funny stuff, right? Right. But wouldn't that also, I mean, by doing that, possibly, if the whole, I guess, the same question in the industry that all doctors had to use same. the form, 
Wouldn't that back the I guess, patient into a corner that they either take it or they don't do it? Oh, so basically every doctor demands the same, so you can't get treatment otherwise. Okay, so that's actually a very good point. Um, Samantha, so go with Ryan's argument, right? How should society then impose a duty on all doctors? What would be a good way of doing this? Right? And, and that everyone has the same consent form, like Ryan mentioned a minute ago. What would be a good way of imposing such, a, such an obligation? Bingo. And I think that also animates this court's concern. Whenever, whenever courts rule, they rule on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Their judgment affects the UC system and these, right? There's an obligation for other doctors to follow this case. They maybe should as a matter of precedent, but they're not bound by it. They're not, the judgment doesn't bind them. However, if the legislature were to address this issue, they could then impose a blanket consent form, right? That every doctor in the state must use the same form when dealing with organ tissues. That would resolve the issue. Now, uh, Kelly, if the legislature did address this issue, what are some of the other factors or criteria the legislature could consider when making this choice? Oh, good. So let's just talk about compensation for that, right? When you have the conversion tort, you guys say this last term, what's usually the measure of damages? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, so usually with, with you know, if, if you steal someone's bicycle, either get the bicycle back or if the bicycle's destroyed, the value of the bicycle, right? I mean, that, that's pretty straightforward. But the value of the cell line is so much greater than what he put in. The conversion tort, then, is not geared toward this sort of problem. The legislature could actually fix this in a much more rational way. They can say, you get X percent of any proceeds from a patented cell line. Whatever it is. I don't know, 2%, percent, one, whatever the number is, right? You get X percentage. So the courts have basically a blunt instrument. They have the conversion tort, which is more or less a strict liability offense with 100% damages, which is insane. You couldn't possibly do this because, as Megan uh, uh, educated us, there's a lot of extra work that goes into this. It's not just the guy's cells. There's other conditions. OK? So I don't even pick on you. The first student ever to actually know what this stuff is in like, all the years I'm teaching, so I'm very, very happy. It's very good. Yeah. I usually have to explain this myself, which I'm very grateful you were able to. Um, so that is rationales in favor of the legislature taking of this matter. California statutes and state laws. Why does that? Is there any statute that addresses this issue directly? No, no. But what do the statutes address? Not not this directly, but something related. No. What were the California statutes that were on the books that were relevant here? Okay, and what do those statutes address? Very good. Okay, good. So, Dylan, if the statutes of the state consider organs outside the body to be waste, what does that say about how the government would view this issue? Like, what does that signal about the government's position? You're right. It's addressing a different issue, but does that say that the government thinks it's your it's your property outside the body? No. Okay, that's right. The fact that the government treats cells outside the body as waste suggests that the legislature views it as just garbage, right? It's not yours once it's out of the body. When it's in your body, it's holy, it's sacred, it's sanctimonious, whatever, right? But outside the body, not yours. Cremate it, destroy it, bury it, whatever it happens to be. Okay? Now, Katie, does this resolve the case, though, right? I mean, the dissent raises this point. Does the fact that the government thinks that these, bo that these cells and organs outside the body are garbage, does that, does that address the case at all? But what's unique about the cells that most people put out of their body? What's unique about those cells? I mean, I'm sorry, what's common about most of our cells? I mean, if I gave you cells, you gave cells, what happens when they're outside the body? And what's special about Henrietta and Mr. Moore? Right, so the, well, the sense says, look, it doesn't really fit, right? Because they, they keep living outside his body. Immortal, immortal life. Okay? So 
the majority, though, at bottom rules that this is for the legislature to decide, that the legislature has signaled that this is not for us to decide, and that this will really constrain research if we rule for the plaintiff, right? That's the majority. And, and if you think about it, this is the whale case, right? It's not much different than the whale case, right? Yes, it involves organs versus whales, but they're trying to encourage socially useful policy. And if the legislature wants to intervene, they can pass a statute. Until they do, uh, they're going to go with the custom of the doctors. The doctors actually had a custom, right? The doctors for years have been taking these cells, like with Nick for Henrietta, without asking for permission. And the doctors more or less established that custom, and the court said, we're going to follow that custom. It's Mr. Moore who's trying to disrupt the status quo. They're going to keep things as they are. So any questions on the majority opinion? Questions on the majority? Yes, Ann. Just the, it's not generally the custom for physicians to have people come back for treatment. <laughs> no, it's not. That they don't need. No, it's not. Cells no, it's not. Out no, it's not. I meant the fact they didn't they didn't compensate the cell uh, donate. But you're right. It was this was a very typical case. I think Mr. Moore just liked the trip to California. Probably didn't care. You know, vacation. Yeah, Mike. Do you know if there was any uh, sanctions taken by the uh, California Medical Board? Oh, I don't know that. It's a good question. My guess is no, because under the laws, if you want, right? I mean, he. But the, the court said he didn't break the law, so I'm not sure what ground it would be to punish him. Well, even under like failure to get that uh, consent. But the law didn't require. I mean, well, you said, oh, was he punished for the breach of fiduciary duty? If I had to guess, he probably wasn't. I think most doctors didn't get any duty, any consent at all. Yeah, if I had to guess. Because, but, but then again, he did get some form signed, so I don't think there'd be enough to discipline. Maybe look it up. I'm not sure. I don't know the answer. Yeah, Lauren. Um, maybe one of like the underlying reasons why maybe they don't necessarily consider your body like property per se is it could it be because you can't necessarily attach a value to it? Whoa. So, how do you how do you put a dollar amount on your cells? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like like if they were to rule in favor of Mr. Moore and they say, okay, they want to do damages, you can't really calculate damages on his cells just because one, you know, well, that's not the cell that they're using. And then how do you really attach a dollar value to it? Well, in countries that allow sales of organs, there's a dollar amount. There's a price list for a kidney. Um, we don't have them in this country, but there's some countries there's a price list for a kidney, and the black market sure as hell is a price list for a kidney. Um, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, Marcos. There, there was a story a couple of years ago, Steve Jobs, Mr. You know, Apple iPhone, he had, uh, was it pancreatic cancer? It was pancreatic cancer. Um, he needed a, a pancreas uh, uh, transplant, and what he actually did was he put his name on the waiting list in all 50 states. Um, how did he do this? He actually purchased homes in all 50 states to establish a domicile. I think he got it, check me, I think it was Tennessee. It might be off. I think it was Tennessee. And it turns out that the doctor who the transplant was living in the home he had purchased Tennessee. Marcus. Well, yeah, you already touched on it. But like the black market, one time a while back on Snapchat, they had. Oh, he's right. Nothing good ever talked to that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> one time a while back on Snapchat. Okay, go on. The story is like one time. Yeah. They show the list of all the organs and how much they were worth and all that stuff on the black market. Yeah, there's a price yeah. list. Huh? There's a price list, yeah. Yeah, like your skin as well. I think it's probably one of the most expensive ones, your skin and then obviously your heart. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the, beyond people stealing kidneys and bathtubs, right, there's, there's also some countries that are moving towards allowing people to donate, um, to donate uh, uh, organs. There's a note in the book about the National Organ Transplant Act. I'll mention this briefly now. Um, Bone marrow. Has anyone ever given bone marrow? It's painful, right? We'll never do it again. We'll never do it again. What if you were being compensated for it? Like millions of dollars. But did it save someone's life, probably? Probably. Yeah. So <laughs> bone marrow bone marrow is considered by the government the same as a kidney. And you can't be paid to donate it, but you can donate it for as a, as a gift, right? Even though you regenerate bone marrow, like after you lost it, it regenerated. And there's been litigation for years about trying to treat bone marrow in the same context as semen or plasma, because you regenerate it, much more difficult to extract. Um, uh, but the government hasn't budged in that one yet. But if there were compensation for bone marrow, I think more people would probably give it. You think so? 
How long were you out for after you did that? What's that? How long were you out after you donated? I kind of felt pain for almost a month. Yeah, it's pretty bad. But, but bone marrow is one of the things where you regenerate it, but the government does not allow you to sell it. And would that be your hip? Uh, yeah, my uh, hip. All right, any other questions? The majority opinion. We're going to the concurring. All right, let's do the concurring opinion. Um, who am I up to? Uh, uh, Lance. What's Justice Arabian? He makes, I think, a very important point here. What's Justice Arabian talking about? Um, I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, what's the moral issue? Why not? Why is Arabian seem very troubled by this opinion? Um, what's like, what's like really bothering him? Yeah, why is why is the human body so sacred? I mean, here's this one line which I always barf on everybody says we can't we can't commingle the sacred with the profane, right? What what's he getting at there? Yeah. And I think he probably views this in the same fashion as like prostitution probably or the use of drugs, that the body is something sacred. I mean, I, I was trying to get the answer before, eventually I got it. But the reason why prostitution and, and, and suicide has been considered so sinful over the, over the millennia is because you're taking the image that God created in his image, right? And that, that's the line of the, the Bible, right? We're creating God's image and you're destroying it. You're, you're ending it. You're, you're, you're disfiguring it. You're, you're deforming it. And for at least Justice Arabian, this is going against some sort of natural order. Now, he doesn't cite the Bible in his opinion. I suppose he could. Um, but, he's, but he's, I think, tapping into a fairly long tradition in our legal system of protecting the body. Right? You don't have to cite the Ten Commandments here. It's not to say we don't allow these things. That's what our society is built on. Yeah, Kendra? Um, wait, can you argue that there's supposed to be separation of church and state? Oh, I was waiting for someone to ask me that. That's a myth. <laughs> Our entire legal system is basically built on, on religion. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I don't need to, to spell the comma, but virtually every law we have at some point was based on something in, 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 te- in Scripture. Not always. Not, not anymore. Not, the Supreme Court recently said that moral disapproval is no longer a rational basis to have laws. So you'll study the uh, same-sex marriage cases, right, in, in, in con law. And uh, what was the reason why we had laws limiting marriage to one man and one woman? To promote procreation within an opposite sex couple. The uh, Supreme Court said that's no longer rational. And I think after that, prostitution law has got to go, drug law has got to go, suicide law has got to go. Lots of laws no longer meet that criteria, but much of our legal system is based on some sort of sense of morality. Uh, religion. Not anymore, but at least historically. But Arabian is, is preaching to the choir, there, no pun intended, uh, uh, and he's definitely giving a very, there it is, he's definitely giving a very churchy message. You're welcome. <laughs> I try. And I don't plan these in advance. They, 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 they come out. All right, so any other thoughts on Justice Arabian's concurring opinion? Justice Arabian. No? All right. Um, uh, who's next? Alec, what's Justice Mosk talking about, his dissent? Um, he's basically saying that uh, people do have a proprietary interest in their body. A what interest? A proprietary. A proprietary. A proprietary. Good, yeah. Um, Actually, so I, I was on a plane the other day, and... No, they always say, do not congregate near the bathrooms. Congregate. The guy kept saying, do not conjugate near the bathroom. <laughs> I don't know if he was making a pun on conjugal or if he just didn't know the, the right, how to conjugate the verb, as it turns out. But, um, but I, I, he said it twice. He said, do not conjugate near the bathroom. I didn't know if he was... Anyway, go on. So, proprietary. Yeah, sorry. I fly a lot. You get bored when you fly a lot. Uh, he's basically saying more had a right to do Right, right. It's very good. So, so the opinion, though, introduces this concept of bundle of rights. And he makes a, makes a very good point, right? Where the same item can have different relationships, right? So, for example, if you're a hunter, right? You hunt an animal. You can eat it. You can give it away. Can you sell it? No, you cannot. So how can it be that you can give 
a, uh, a, a hunt, a game away, but you can't sell it. My favorite example is your law license, right? God willing, you'll graduate in a couple of years, get your degree, you pass the bar, right? Can you sell your degree to someone else? Can you go on Craigslist and buy a law degree? There were actually years ago, there was a guy who sold his law degree on Craigslist. He was very bitter. Uh, but but um, could, if I hand you my law degree, it's like, oh, now I'm a lawyer, right? No. So you can buy it in the sense of going to law school for three years and passing an exam, but you can't transfer your law license. So very often, right, property is viewed in a, um, a, in a different manner depending how you, how, how you go about it. The dissent acknowledges this ethical imperative, right? right? Slavery is abhorrent. But then he flips it, and I think in, in a very profound way. He says, Instead of just talking about slavery, recognize what's going on with Henrietta, right? <coughs> recognize what's going on with Mr. Moore. Their slaves, oh, damn it, their cells are in effect <laughs> enslaved. Right? That's what the sense is getting at. That basically you're owning his cells. So if we start from the position that you own your own body and you can't have slavery, okay, that's fine. But that means he has a right to his own cells, even if they're outside his body. So he flips the majority on its head, right? The majority is like, we don't want to have any ownership of cells because that's like slavery. But what they're saying is they already own his cells. They're profiting off of his cells. They are enslaved. So as a result, he says, fundamental fairness requires us to act. He cites unjust enrichment. He writes they're not in equal bargaining positions, right? You have a sophisticated doctor, you have a pipeline worker. And this pipeline worker is getting zero, and the doctor is getting really wealthy. Okay. He notes that the legislature is competent to act. But he says, the fact that the legislature may intervene does not relieve the courts of acting. This sentence you'll see over and over again, right? The mere fact that Congress and the legislature could step in, that doesn't deprive me of my jurisdiction, right? If a court has jurisdiction, he can intervene and resolve the case, right? We have to resolve the case before us. Um, he also notes that non-disclosure is not an adequate remedy, right? It's worse than conversion because you have to show that some sort of connection between the injury and the duty to inform. That is, you have to show that even if there was adequate consent, he wouldn't have given off the organs, which is probably hard to show. Um, so in summary, the dissent says that non-disclosure likely won't be successful. The majority opinion fails to protect patients' rights and allows the exploiters to escape liability. Okay? So, I mean, just balance the majority. I think they both have fairly good arguments. This is a case where I think it's, it's pretty close. Although Justice Mosk was in dissent alone. Um, let's try this. I just I'll, I'll poll the class, see how you guys do. Who, who agrees with the majority is A, and then dissent is B? I don't know. Uh, it's going to screw up the counting. Just make it easier. Uh, you know what? Fine, fine, fine. Okay. A is a uh, majority. B is concurring. C is dissent. Let's just uh, see where people fall. I will let this on for thirty seconds. I like this much better than show of hands because I find whoever raises your hands first always intimidates the other three people. <laughs> so this is actually anonymous. It's, it's, it, I've been doing this long enough. I know that. that, that, that yeah. Okay. You know, there's 10 seconds. All right, stop it here. Okay, that's what we got. Wow, okay. Most people dissent. Okay, so uh, one of the, uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up on this point. Um, Justice Scalia would often say that law students are um, corrupted on the common law, right? You come to law school not knowing anything. You see these, oh my God, these judges, these oracles in robes who can make a ruling to remedy what's wrong with society. And think that every problem in the world can be solved by a common law judgment. And then you get to two L's, like, oh crap, we have Congress, right? <laughs> we have a legislature who can actually pass statutes. Um, so if you learn nothing else, I said all the time, if you learn nothing else from me, not every problem has a judicial remedy, which I think is number C, uh, uh, which is the dissent. Um, but that dwarfed both A and B, okay? 
All right, any other questions for me on, uh, on uh, the uh, Moore case? Very good case, it's an entire class case, I like it. Any other questions on the Moore case? No? All right, I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you so much.